Fred, thank you so much for, uh, I know how busy you are. Thank you for your time. Um, it's been an honor to be following your work for ages. Um, for people that um, maybe like 2% that don't know you, can you, you just uh, tell us uh, who Brett is, AKA Glute Guy? I wouldn't go so far as in the two percent who don't know me, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, I'm known as the glue guy. That's my my niche. Uh, I like to think of myself as knowing a lot about all of the areas of strength and conditioning. Um, I've been lifting weights for 27 years now. Uh, I've been a personal trainer for 22 years. Uh, I love. I'm in my gym right now. I own a gym in San Diego. This is my life. I love strength and conditioning. I got my PhD in sports science. Uh, I have my CSDS with distinction from the NSBA. Um, I try to publish research and I also try to like, uh, I guess, uh, reach the mainstream by being active on social media and it kind of flows. It was blogging and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, and then now I'm on Instagram with the stories. I try to like, you know, roll, like go with the flow of social media. So, uh, but that does mean a lot to me. It's not just, you know, a lot of scientists just speak to other scientists. They don't try to relate to the the, the average person. That's a pet peeve I have. Um, with the academia world. So I, I I consider myself a coach first and a personal trainer and so and well actually I consider myself a lifter first. Oh, I yeah. want to know answers because I'm trying to see I'm trying to make improvements. I want to be bigger and stronger and, and <laughs> Amen brother. <laughs> and it's uh, as I said uh, as we were chatting before, you're a bro that does science. Because we sometimes forget where we started. Yes. And the, the difference was, but I always say is, we had the scientists that couldn't combine the, 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 the bro aspect, the training, and they had no idea. And then we had the bros that they were like, oh, I just want to pop my biceps. And now we've got people like you that bridge that gap. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's uh, what we need more people bridging that gap. I don't. I really don't like how I see a lot of coaches who will say, you know, oh, screw the science. We're always ahead of the science. We're two years ahead of the science. We paved the way anyway. They're just catching up to us. And I have all the research I need right here. And on the other hand, you'll see scientists just shun the coaches and be like, they're just a bunch of meatheads that don't understand science and they say a lot of stupid things. Exactly, and uh, they, you know, it's not even worth having a conversation with them because they don't even speak the language of science, and uh, they might they they they, sh they speak a lot of pseudoscience and bro science because we might know how to get you strong or muscular or fast and powerful, but we don't always know the right mechanisms and how it's really working. We know this is what seems to work, but we don't know how it actually works. And a lot of times our methods are outdated, you know. Yeah, of course. It's trial and error, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, my, 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 my theme of this uh, interview, basically, uh, talk was uh, glute beyond the look. Because it's not only about um, uh, the booty. It, there are underlying mechanisms that help. Like for me, that I've, um, I've been working with lower back patients for years, and I'm in, uh, mostly in rehab. We know that imbalances in joint and muscle function create like a stress patterns and more pain. And we know that hip and back pain can cause like gluteal muscle inhibition. And we've seen that. Uh, some people say, oh, your glute doesn't fire. I'm not going to say that. But glute is inhibited because not enough power is coming out. What's your, um, what's your take and how we can basically increase our hip uh, power in order to address any issues we have with back pain or any hip instability because it's, it's a big thing now that people, you know, spending a lot of time sitting, um, not, I'm not going to go into posture, but not good mechanics, biomechanics. 
So here's a great example of what I was just talking about, where coaches a lot of times know a good solution, but we don't may not understand the science behind it. Uh, and this is a perfect, just a perfect segue to that. So I have this gym, Glute Lab. I'm sitting in it right now. We train, I don't know, almost 200 people every month here. I can't tell you how many people come here and they have back pain. And the very first session, we tweak their form and their pain goes away. And we teach them how to do the exercises um, the way we teach them. And then their back pain goes away and never resurfaces. And so what would be logical for a strength coach or a personal trainer to conclude then is, hey, <laughs> the way they were doing it causes harm to the body and, and pain, and then I teach them how to do it in a manner that doesn't cause harm. However, there's a lot of, and this is where uh, we need to blend the research together. There's a ton of research out there showing that tissue damage does not automatically mean pain. You can give people MRIs and show that uh, uh, tons of people have jacked up shoulders, knees, hips, uh, intervertebral discs, but they ha they're asymptomatic. They have no pain. Um, yeah. And so, so what's going on here? Well, um, the, the, the pain science, so here's where there's, there's like the biomechanist and then the pain scientist, and they're at odds with one another. The pain scientist will say that Tissue damage does not equal pain. It has, they have nothing to do with one another, and there are many reasons why you might be in pain. And there's, there's a, they have the biopsychosocial model. There's biological, mm -hmm. psychological, sociological, and biomechanical reasons, and we have to blend them all together. And they're right about that. Um, but they will say things like a prior injury, something like a nocebo effect from something you've been told long ago, mm -hmm. uh, depression, uh, your social situation, if you smoke cigarettes, things like yeah. that. They can all in increase your likelihood of pain. And, but then we're sitting here in the gym going, how does this person's social life have to do with what's going on with my if they smoke? Like, I'm ha they're hyperextending their back when they do a reverse hyper or a hip thrust, or a back extension, or they're flexing their spine excessively when they do a deadlift, or going too deep for their anatomy in a squat, and their butt weakening too much. <clears throat> and we teach them how to do it differently, and their pain goes away. So we can conclude, when this person hyperextends, their back hurts. Well, the pain yeah. scientists would say, it's not that you um, remove the, the offender like the hyperextension, that you just tweaked it and did it differently, and they had a neuro tag, or they had like their neuro oh, matrix yeah. tweak things, and then their pain went away. And the biomechanist would say, "Yeah, you're full of crap. I see this way too much." Uh, and so we need to come together. But what annoys me is that uh, you, you got both sides ignoring each other. We need to meet in the middle. So the pain scientists, they're not. An, I don't know a single pain scientist that trains people with heavy weights, like, for example, what I do for a living. Um, and they think, uh, so I've heard them say things like, you can, uh, you can um, adapt to any, anything. You can adapt to anything. Uh, you, you know, if you do it gradually and, and you know, Low the slowly, digits, slowly, the time. yeah. And so you could do round back deadlifts for life and you could be just fine. Um, well, that's the extreme, you know, because, uh, I mean, we can see, Olympic weightlifters, their knees come in. They, they, they have that like valgus twitch, I call it, at the bottom. You can see powerlifters will round their, mostly their upper backs, you know. But it's, it's how much. You know, I'm, I've competed in powerlifting. I've deadlifted 620 pounds. Um, I round, and I'm a rounder, but I round fully. I don't round all the way. I don't fully flex my spine. It's like same I know. With, same thing with your squat, correct? Out. Same thing with your squat because of your hips, and you've had an article regarding that. Because like, some people say you're doing like a good morning, but that's how your anatomy is. Well, so I like to say things like, well, I'm rounding, when a deadlift, I'm rounding mostly at my upper back, but no, I'm rounding my low back too. And 
I blame my anatomy for my squat. I'm tall with long femurs, but I can I can do a high bar squat fine. I just can't go as heavy. I think that's more weak quads, but that's another story. But sticking to the pain thing, uh, so here's what it likely is. So let's say I get a client in here and she's had back pain. Now, it's, it's different if you get someone who just has had chronic pain for like 10 years and they're, they're mostly sedentary or they like, I think that's a whole different scenario than someone who yes. oh, has been lifting weights for the last three years and a year ago they started getting back pain only after lower body day. Mm -hmm. And so then you look at their mechanics and you say, okay, this, this person, it's, it's so often it's that they hyperextend with hip thrust, reverse hypers, and back extensions. And you teach them how to not hyperextend, and then it's like magic, you know? So that's why we've come up with all these cues and things. We do, when you do hip thrust, look forward, and at the top your chin will be tucked and you'll be pulling your pelvic tilting. Then you're not you're not overextending the, the low back, then you're fine. Or in a reverse hyper, I put my hand on their low back and I say, I want this to remain flat. I want the movement to occur at the hip, not at the low back. Don't come up so high. Come up that high with the hip, but not with the back. And then they're like, oh my God, I feel this way less in my back and more in my glutes. And the back extension, we teach the round back 45 degree hyper with your feet turned up for more glutes. Uh, but there are rules to these different activities. So, so we would conclude that I'm changing their mechanics and uh, and that's why their pain went away. But there could be more explanations. Or, or, or actually a lot of people conclude I'm strengthening their glutes and therefore their pain goes, now their pain goes away because glutes are so important. And it's likely a combination of all these things. It's like, yes, having strong glutes, you'll use them and not other muscles, um, and you'll stay more neutral. Also, the promotion of, you have uh, strong glutes, of, you of using your hips rather than your lumbar, because a lot of people are cannot understand the hip hinge mechanism. And by yeah. introducing your, the glutes or the hip thrust, I think it's a really good uh, segue to learning their uh, how to move. Yeah, and the RDL and the and squat, everything, squats, you, you learn how to use your powerful leg and hip muscles and not, and keep your, you're still using your back muscles, but you're using your back muscles statically or isometrically, and you're using your prime movers dynamically, whereas if you see, if I just pick up, you know, I'm in the gym here all the time, I try to move economically, so if I, if I'm picking up a, uh, the 106 pound kettlebell. I don't drop down into a squat or a perfect hip hinge. I will like be leaning off to one side, round over and grab it. But that I know is safe for me. That's a light weight. Now, if it's the day after heavy deadlifts, I don't do it that way though. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, for sure. There's more, there's, there's more to the story. But if it's heavy weight, I sure as hell am not going to round fully and be asymmetrical. Um, I don't think, in the, using the example we said earlier, how people say you can ad adapt to anything, the round back deadlift is probably the most extreme example. I don't think you can adapt. I mean, you see people who, um, you're assuming these structures can strengthen, yeah. you know, your 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 ligaments and your discs and everything, I, and I don't think they can strengthen that much so that we, they can withstand, you know, you doing like a 700-pound deadlift with a fully rounded back. I think what powerlifters do is they learn, here's neutral spine, here's fully flexed, here's halfway in the middle. If I keep it there, I'm okay. But if I go too much, I injure myself. And that's what I found with myself. It's like, and I think experienced lifters know where that breaking point is. And I know for me, I'll round, but I don't fully flex. And if my body starts to deviate, it starts to move eccentrically into into more rounding. I let the bar go. I shut it down. 100%. Otherwise, I know I'm going to have an immediate that's, back injury. And, and that's it's the why same thing with general public yeah. needs to understand that we don't count reps. We count good movement. Even if our program says eight yeah. reps and you think you're losing it on the fourth, just let the bar go. And also the prioritization, right? Because you cannot have heavy days every day. You're not. You're, that can happen. Even the great lifters, you know better. You could have a, a heavy day. If, you, if we see it um, biologically, uh, for our bones to start reconfiguring, we need every five days a really heavy, heavy day. I don't know if you agree with that. 
Well, I, I will tell you, I, you know, DUP got really popular a few years back, uh, daily undulated periodization, and I started giving a lot of my clients, and I, I increased them gradually, but it's just, it's, the more frequently you lift heavy, especially with the same lift, it's getting greedy. You, you, <clears throat> it's like playing stocks. You yep. get, you will get faster returns, but it comes at a cost, and so it's more risky. And if you don't know how to periodize and you don't know how to do it properly, you will hurt yourself. So if you just try to do, you know, and it got popular, squat to a max every day. I even wrote an article about it with John Bros uh, back in the day with, for T Nation. Uh, yeah, his Olympic lifters, he'd have them squat to a max every single day. And they were doing, you know, 30, like 30, probably an hour straight of squatting practically. And, and they could adapt to it, but later it was discovered that a lot of these people were on, uh, I think it was discovered that a lot of them were on juice. Oh, so yeah. you can recover faster. But also, it doesn't matter what what's best for... More people need to be concerned with what's best for the long run, not the short term. So, yeah, like, Rocco, if you were, came to me and said, hey, Brett, can you help me improve my squat in the next month? I need to put, you know, I need to put 30 pounds or 15 kgs on my squat in the next month or else something bad's going to happen. Then, yeah, we're going to squat way more often and be more for risky. Sure. But that's not this. I'm not going to do that the whole year for you because you'll start – you could probably start developing knee pain and knee issues. And it's like, you need, yes, so when you, what you're saying is to have like five days in between really heavy lifts, I agree, I, I generally agree with that. Like, well, I think you can do like a heavy squat day each week. Yes, for sure. Heavy deadlift each week, heavy hip lifts, but I don't think you should do heavy, heavy lifts, you know, like heavy squat three, four, three times a week is really tough. Well, Beginners can get away with it, but once you're more advanced, uh, that's why I like variations. It's like throw in a pause, throw in goblet squats, throw in pause reps, throw in really strict front squats, throw in single leg work. And the older I get, the more I realize the value of single leg work. Um, sure. Because you train the pattern, with, but with less stress on the back. And you're, you're, the legs are getting the full stimulus, but the back is receiving less stimulus. Exactly. Now that you said single leg, leg, uh, what what do you think is the relationship between hamstring legs and gluteal muscle strength? So we've seen we've seen uh, a lot of uh, research, which is not significantly, you know, we haven't seen anything, but a lot of people are saying that it is a big thing, and you've trained a lot of people. So what's your take on that? Yeah, I don't think on SIJ, a, right? A dysfunction. Well, I don't think there's a relationship there. Uh, yeah, it's like. Uh, it's, you know, and then the research that shows that, that uh, if you have, and I don't even know what the theory would be, that if you have shorter hamstrings, you would have stronger glutes or, um, but yeah, I haven't seen that in my practice. It's, it's, hamstring flexibility is a genetic, a, a big genetic component and everyone thinks they're tight. I can't tell you how many girls I train that they're like, my muscles are tight and I'm like, you're doing a stiff leg deadlift all the way down to the ground. And then I show them, I'll get them down on the ground in an active straight leg raise, and I'll say, here's fat, and I'll have it, their leg at a 45 degree angle, okay? This is, this is, some of my guy friends are like this, this is bad. <laughs> and I pull it up to 90 degree angle, and I go, if you can get to here, you're superior. Now look at you, and I crank it all the way back to the, where they're at like 135 degree angle. I mean, some of these girls can like wrap their leg around their head. And they still think they're tight. It's like they their 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 opinion of flexibility is like a, a you know a, a, a like advanced yogi or gymnast. And so I'll let them know that you are well above average in terms of flexibility, but they perceive themselves to be tight because they're doing exercises that move you into a stretch, like stiff leg deadlifts. You're gonna feel tight at the bottom, and uh, a lot of people I think it, well. Stretching, it's like you got people like who never stretch and think it's stupid and you, you know, just lift weights and you never need to stretch. That was my next have, question. And then you have people who stretch every day and think it's so important and, and really it, it's in the middle. You, you shouldn't over, uh, value, over um, you shouldn't have an improper opinion of how important stretch is, stretching is for function. 
but you also shouldn't uh, dismiss it because <laughs> weight, weight training builds flexibility pretty well. Like, think about it. Rocco, you and I can probably drop into a deep squat really well, and we can do a good hip hinge and like a stiff leg deadlift pattern without without rounding and go yeah. deep. But, but there are movements that stretching won't take you into. For example, shoulder internal and external rotation, hip internal and external rotation, where you you need to be flexible all over, and and it also depends on the how labor, active. the so- and there are other. Oh. And that's your anatomy has yeah. a lot to do with it. So because um, we've we've seen that in powerlifters that I always say that um, we know what happens. You know better. It was your also you did the PhD and when we when we stretch a muscle, we know what happens to the sarcomere. And when the sarcomere basically uh, um, uh, stretches, it becomes weaker. So if you're a powerlifter, I cannot see why you need to spend so much time in that uh, passive stretch rather than you can do a PNF or ballistic or you can do it through your movement. So that's an interesting thing. Um, for okay, initially, and this is where science is valuable because the pendulum is going back and forth. So initially, we just assumed if you stretch, you lengthen the muscle. It makes sense. You're stretching, you lengthen the muscle. And then in like the early 2000s, some researchers start pointing out that all the research on stretching shows that you're not actually lengthening muscle. You're doing nothing to the muscle itself. It's acting on the nervous system. They call it increasing stretch tolerance. Mm -hmm. And the stretching that most of us do, like for 10 minutes after a workout, yes, you do gain flexibility. Say you gain in, you know, a month of stretching the hamstrings, you might gain five more degrees of of hamstring flexibility. But, uh, But it's not changing any properties of the muscle itself. It's just changing... The brain, it it, uh, it it senses less danger, so it lets you go deep. It releases the break. You're increasing yeah, your stress tolerance. Bulger tendons, but, muscle spindles. Yeah, it's working on the uh, on the on the um, you know, it's working on the, the 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 receptors that sense these things in the nervous system. Not you know on the on you're not the actually increasing. Uh, fascicle length or increasing sarcomeres in series or changing the the properties of the muscle. Mm-hmm. And then some mm-hmm. more recent research shows that you do, so that you are. And so it's like, okay, we probably went too far the one way, but also you, t- you can't tell me, like, look at like a, a gymnast or a yogi, you can't tell me their muscles aren't longer, that it's all just, because to say it only works on stretch tolerance would mean that all of us have the ability to wrap our our <laughs> leg around our head, <laughs> uh, but we just our our nervous system won't allow it and that's just not true you have passive stiffness and you can you can measure passive stiffness on an isokinetic dynamometer i mean i remember my buddy rob big old muscular guy and i'm pushing on him as hard as i can and you know eventually i mean think about muscle tissue and this is what uh you mentioned you're close with Stu McGill. He he found this out long ago that like even if you do a round back deadlift, your 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 back is still conti- so when you round over, you will have what's called uh, it's called a lumbar flexion relaxation okay. phenomenon. You get myoelectrical silence in the muscle. The the the, neuro, the neurological activity shuts off, but you still they're still helping contribute to the lift. Think about it. You have to stabilize somehow. So here you're stabilizing passively, elastically, not through active muscle force. But think of like having a uh, think of having a power lifter's muscles, like their erectors, hanging on a, 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 a curtain, and you're pulling on them, tugging on them. Your muscles actually produce greater. The greatest tension you can experience in a muscle is fully stretched. A lot of people say, yeah. no, the greatest tension is in mid-range. That's no, the no, greatest no. action tension. But total tension is, when it's, uh, is, is achieved in a full stretch. So right. you could have your, you could be doing a fly, for example, and you could have your, your, the dumbbells fully out extended until your pecs stretch to their full capacity. And you could have them not even activated, and they can sustain that load. Now, it's dangerous because you go a little too far and you tear a muscle, but... Um, but anyway, muscles are very strong passively, 
and that's fine. The problem is, it's the other structures that that are associated with it. So when you round your back, if there weren't these discs there and these ligaments there that get stretched as well, then, it, well, well with the, in the case of the discs, the nucleus uh, pulposus gets pushed to the, towards the, you know, like, like if you round your back, it gets pushed towards the rear of the disc, and then that's, it, it starts working its way through the lamellae Annual, yeah. and, and through the yeah. annular fibers, and then it, it becomes a herniation. And so that's where you have to be careful, and that's why you don't want to round. That's why you want to use active muscles. So what you were saying was the reps are good when uh, the the reps are are mostly good when the reps count when you're using good form, not when you're using bad form. Well, if you're using poor form, then you're relying more on passive structures. When you use good form, it's the active muscles absorbing mo most of the load. You start using sloppy form and you start, you know, rounding and caving in. We call it the melting candle syndrome where like, you know, you do a squat and you see this, uh, you, you, you do a squat and you see them uh, melting candle. They just cave inwards everywhere. They round, their knees cave in, they just sink inwards. And that collapsing mechanism is associated with a lot of, uh, you know, ligaments being stretched, uh, passive tissue, labrums, like, like the, the cartilage surrounding the joint structures, the tendons getting uh, worn down more. And we, we saw and that so, in, in, in competitions in uh, strength, uh, like the in, um, strength or CrossFit, where you saw, like, when there was, because strength and endurance is exactly what Sir McGill says, and you said that in one of your articles, that, It's not a matter of having strong muscles, it's about being able to endure with good patterns, good good mechanics for a long time. And that's why we had like in the strongman, we saw a lot of people like when they did, you know, lots of repetitions on squatting, you could see that basic um, tremble before they had an injury because they couldn't make it. Or in CrossFit, you could see so many, um, like I think it was two years ago, so many hamstring tears because there were a lot of deadlifts, uh, a lot of cleans, and um, it's exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I think last year the pec tears with the, all the discs. Oh, oh God, yeah. <laughs> that was a party. But, but that's where we talk about, okay, in competition, you accept the risks. If I'm going out, if I'm competing in powerlifting, that's, I, I'm, I know what I'm getting myself into. It's like, okay, if, if it's my third pull, this is my third deadlift, and I'm up there on the platform, and I'm going for a PR, I'm going to try to pull with good form, but maybe the bar doesn't leave the ground with a good arch. And I just round it. A little round a little, and then all of a sudden the bar flies up. And I'm fighting it, fighting it, fighting it. Yeah, that's, that's your, your decision to drop it or, or fight it I'll out and see it. if you can lock it out. But that you're, you're going into it knowing the risk. And you can be more or less risky according to your personal preference. Just like if you're a... Um, a co combat fighter, you know that you could get seriously maimed or injured. And if you're a CrossFit or a strongman or Olympic weightlifting, you know that something could go wrong. You're going into it knowing that. But if you're a physique competitor or lifting weights for a, for a non-weightlifting sport, like football, soccer, baseball, basketball, hockey, rugby, uh, all these sports, in that case, then why be risky? You're, yeah, you're sure. using weights. To, you're using weights to either improve your physique or you're using it to improve your performance. It doesn't work with weights. Yeah, having poor form, you know, there's no reason for it. Now, that's easier said than done because at some point along the way, we, you know, everyone starts out wanting to lift weights for, for to look better, and then we kind of get greedy. We get plug, we get the itch, we go, wow, I'm really strong at this exercise or this exercise, and you, everyone, everyone's structure, it's just like you look at Michael Phelps versus Usain Bolt. Yeah. If Usain yeah. would have tried to be a swimmer, and Michael Phelps tried to be a sprinter, they would have been the worst, <laughs> yeah, it would have been terrible, but their bodies were well structured for their individual sports, and what you find, and this is what I love about personal training, yeah, not everyone's going to be a good squatter, but... A lot of people can be excellent deadlifters. They can be good at single leg. They can be good at hip thrust. 
Maybe they suck at bench press, but they're good at rows and chin-ups. And you let them know, wow, you're really good at these. And, you know, they, they start liking strength training because of how many chin-ups or inverted rows or how much they can hip thrust or their walking lunge ability. And so that's why I like strength training in general, not just powerlifting. I try to empower people to reach their best at all these different exercises and be the strongest overall person they can be. So that involves getting them strong at all these exercises. Well, uh, you tend to, you start to get strength goals and then you start to be irrational when you're training. If everyone just trained for the mind-muscle connection and the feel, you wouldn't see so many injuries. The problems arise when we want to set a new record or deadlift PR, and it's the lift that people care the most about where they let their form degrade the most because no one cares about your seated row, so you don't <laughs> see, the, you don't see yeah. the form erode yeah. that much. It's the, they, they care about the biggest lift, which involve the most weight, which, so they're the most dangerous because they're the, they have the most weight and they're the most complex, and you're moving it through a large range of motion, exactly. but also because yeah. you care so much. 100%. I had a lot of women uh, when we, I said I'm going to have this interview saying, because it was also a debate between Lyle and Mike Israel regarding uh, uh, hypertrophy and stuff. And Lyle said, because we had another a paper come out, I think it was today, between what is the best um, percentage um, max um, RM for growth? So I remember an article back like 2008 that was between 80 and 85 percent for maximum repetitions, let's say, uh, or between 10 and 12 that everybody says. What's your take? Because my second question would be how many times, because you made the glutes becoming the new biceps. Everybody's doing it every day. You know what I mean? And people are getting every day I'm going to do glutes so they can grow. So first question, the percentage, and then second question, how many times per day, yeah, per week? Gotcha. Okay. So th this, is, this is an interesting question because, because what the research has found is that all loads build muscles well. Now, the problem if you just did one rep masters is that you'd have to do so many reps and your workout would last, you'd have to do so many sets because you need to achieve a certain amount of reps, of, you know, uh -huh. the, the, all of stimulating reps that stimulate growth. And if you do high rep sets, the first, you know, say you do a set of 20 to failure, the first 15 don't do much. It's the last five that really build muscle. If you do a one rep max, yes, it all counts towards building muscle, but it's only one rep. And so you can build muscle doing, well, like Brad Junko and I have a paper showing three sets of 10 cause greater growth than three sets of three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's more reps involved. But you could do just more sets of three and build muscle just fine. The problem is you, your workout takes so long and it beats up the joints a little bit more. So yeah. this is what I like about being an actual researcher where you, where you actually conduct studies and you interact with the, you know, the, the, with the subjects, with the participants, and you hear what they have to say. So when you do a study like, like Brad's... Uh, Brad's, um, I think it was his, his PhD paper where he, his study, where he com compared a powerlifting routine to a bodybuilding routine, but they equated volume. Well, they saw similar growth. The problem was the bodybuilding workout took 20 minutes. The powerlifting workout took over an hour. So yep. what if the bodybuilding workout did more sets, more time in the equated time? They don't do that in the research much. They equate volume, but never time. So it's a, it's, it's doesn't tell you the whole story. So what you know, what'll happen when you when you do these have these, these studies involving really heavy weight, at the end all the participants are like worried. They're like, I feel like I'm gonna injure myself. I'm yeah. beat down. I, my joints are hurting. They finish the study and they have to take a couple weeks off. Then when you do high rep studies to failure, like like you have one group doing sets of twenty to thirty to failure, they want to puke. And some of them do okay. throw they get nauseous. Now, you can't improve upon that, your buffering capacity and all that, but uh, it's still, some people like me, it's always nauseating. It's just brutal. And so for that reason, there's a sweet spot of like, you know, 6 to 12 reps or 8 to 12, where it's 
it's uh, it's like that sweet spot where it's not too heavy to beat up your joints. It's not too high rep to be daunting and make you nauseous. But ultimately, uh, there might you might get more. There's some evidence. Like Stu Phillips would disagree with this, but Brad Schoenfeld uh, has you know there, has shown me some evidence so, showing that if you do really heavy weight, you have a little bit of skewness towards. Uh, is that even a word, skewness? Uh, you, you, <laughs> you skewed a little bit towards you're building the tight two muscle fibers, and then high rep are skewed a little bit more towards building the type one fibers, and therefore you might see better results doing a combination of reps. But if, if that is the case, it's not like night and day. It's not like you'll get 20% more growth. It might be the extra 5% or something, you know? Um, but either way, I think 8 to 12 is that sweet spot. It's uh, it's it's both economical in terms of it's it, it, you know if you do a it's economical because most of the reps are productive mm-hmm. they contribute towards well especially if you do like sets of eight but sets of twelve and and it doesn't beat up the joints and it doesn't make you nauseous and it's economical it's a productive use of your time in the gym now the second part of your question how frequently that's an an area for me where it's because it's like okay in the research there's so many studies now and there's a clear advantage of training a muscle twice a week as opposed to once a week but there's not much evidence showing a benefit towards training a muscle more often than twice a week now under a situation where you're spe- I, so I don't think you could say well train all the muscles four or five times a week but let's say you want to specialize and you say my arms are lagging or my glutes are lagging and you want your, your glutes or some other muscle to come up you want to bring them up. And you say, I'm going to start doing 30 sets a week for my glutes or 30 sets a week for my arms. Well, in that situation, it's better to split it into three, day, three days, training days, because... Uh, so you mean total you volume? Get, yeah, you want qu- quality volume. After about 10 hard sets, it's not as quality. You have some central fatigue and... and, and no recovery. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and As so, we forget that sometimes fact, we're talking about people that are uh, eight hours or ten hours in the office, and they're planning to see right. do what they saw on Instagram. You know what I mean? It's different. Right. When we're talking more now, athletes. It's different. When we're talking about a general population that just want to be healthy and look yep. good. Right. So for that reason, I think twice a week for most muscles. If you're specializing three to four times a week, but here's something no one ever talks about when we have these debates. They always just use general, well, they'll quote research, but there's no research on glutes, for example. All the research is usually on muscles like quads, biceps, triceps, pecs, things that are easily accessible. Not a lot of research like messing with the glutes because it's, you know, covered up, it's whatever, it's, they're the glutes. So maybe the glutes can handle more frequency, or maybe not, and maybe it depends on the types of exercise you're doing. For example... When you do a lunge, you never you never do these like rapid. You can't move that fast down into a lunge and reverse it, uh, especially when you're going heavy. You have to lower it slowly because your body has to reverse it at the bottom, you know? Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so you have a pronounced eccentric phase, okay? When you do a hip thrust or even a deadlift, you can let gravity just bring the weight down for you because the bar crashes to the ground. Yes. And that's yes. what we found in my PhD thesis with hip thrust. You can control, you can absolutely control the eccentric if you wanted to, but most people don't. don't. What we don't. found is people use three times the concentric force than the eccentric force during hip thrust. Where in a squat, it was only about 10% more. So kind of crazy though. That means most people do a hip thrust and then let the let gravity do the for them on the way down. Now you could go slowly and control it, but most people don't. So it goes. It's, so it, it it stands to reason that lunges and squats are going to have a greater eccentric component, and they also stretch you to a longer muscle length. So they're going to create more muscle damage, and so you can't do them as frequently, and do as much volume on them because they 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 need repair. But what if you do a barbell glute bridge, or think about band work? When we put a a glute loop or a hip circle around your knees and start doing band work. You never even move into a stretch. For the upper glutes, the glute medius and upper glute max subdivision, oh, yeah. you have to move into adduction, 
you're going neutral to short position, neutral to shorten, and the, there's not even a lot of tension at neutral. The tension is in the shortened position, and so that's why I call that penalty-free volume. It's like you could just throw in a few sets of that at the end of the workout, and it can contribute to muscle growth. It doesn't beat you up. It, it doesn't make you too tired and sore. And so for that reason, I think that uh, it, the types of exercises you do matters. And so if you do mu exercises that don't move you to as long a ranges of motion, uh, that focus on shorter ranges of motion, and uh, or sorry, that don't stretch the muscles as much, uh -huh. and then where you're not lowering so slowly, you know, think of a bench press. You got to lower it, and you feel the pecs lengthening. You know, that's a that has a heavy eccentric component, whereas some muscles, do, some exercises don't. And you've said that um, in many articles so, about the hip thrust that if you do it correctly, with the eccentric and concentric component, then it you get worth the squeeze rather than just letting down by gravity and basically not getting anything. Yeah. In fact. Uh, I, I always like people to try that when they do hip thrust. Uh, come up to the top, get in good position, and then lower it under control and try to feel the glutes on the way down. Then don't touch down. Reverse the motion right before the plates touch down, and then keep constant tension. What you'll find is you have to use about 60% of the load as you normally do, and you get a crazy pump and burn in the glutes. And so, yeah, that's that's what we were talking about earlier, using weights to build the muscles versus to demonstrate, you know, feats of strength. And so using better form and a stricter tempo is is always good for muscle growth because it's also sparing on the joints. And I've seen that with uh, some people that, uh, they, uh, especially the uh, last couple of years, uh, they were having I, I, iliotibial uh, band uh, syndrome. And I, I don't know if you've seen that because they were focusing so much on their glute and they were uh, not giving so much on their interior part, uh, rec fem or uh, TFL, uh, and they were having problems. I don't know if you've seen something like that because they're over uh, training their, uh, their uh, glutes. Have you seen that? Yeah, so I don't have a, a lot of, a ton of experience training like runners with uh, iliotibial band syndrome, but it's, it's definitely, um, worth, I mean, it's worth experimenting, but what else are you going to do to try to get it to improve, you know, you can focus on their, their, their running mechanics, you can do this, but strengthening their glutes, um, you know, tends to help because that's associated with that lateral chain, you know, the glute medius, the upper glute max, that control abduction and internal rotation, that's what's going to cause the, the stretch on the IT band that can become problematic over time. So, um, it, to me, it's a no-brainer. Like, you know, a lot of people will, I'll see these researchers scoff at something or they're, they're skeptical about something. I'm like, okay, well, what would you do if you had a client come to you with this problem? What would your, you tell me what your solution would be. Yeah, critics are a dime a dozen. There's all these critics oh. out there, but if if you trap them into a situation where they had to say what their solution would be, you it can depends. point out. That's, yeah. That's that, <laughs> it depends. Um, uh, some last questions because uh, I know you're really busy. Um, hip thrust, glute bridge, rope pump. When and why? In order to increase hip strength. And squat strength. Okay. Hip thrusts would be the most important for, because of the range of motion. Um, a lot of people feel their quads a lot in a hip thrust or their hamstrings or their adductors. Or, but the fact of the matter is you're moving your hips through a large range of motion. The hip thrust does strengthen the glutes the most, but it also strengthens the quads, hammies, adductors, and low back. Therefore, I don't like it being called an isolation lift yeah. or a single joint lift. You actually have movement at different joints, and it works a hell of a lot of muscle. But I think the hip thrust is going to be best for improving total hip strength and squat strength because it moves you through a deeper range of motion. Now, the glute bridge is beneficial for people who want to fill their glutes, but they feel their quads a lot in the hip, in the hip thrust. You give them the glute bridge, and then it takes their quads out of it a little bit, and now they start feeling their glutes more. They like it. 
And but the goal is to get you moving through more ranges of like larger ranges of motion. But if if someone just doesn't like the hip thrust, I have no problem sticking yeah, them with glute bridges. But what I like to make the glute bridge better is load it up with 25 pound plates, not 45 pound plates, or 10 kg, not 20 kg plates, because then they don't the, the plates don't touch the ground. You feel it through a fuller range of motion. Um, a lot of and, people are mistaken. It, it, they're using their hamstrings rather than your glutes, and sometimes they use like a wedge in order to turn turn off the hamstring. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, and so, um, so that, that I like the hip thrust more, but they, but and then with frog pumps, I don't like as a you know you're not going to do a set of eight with frog pumps. Those you do for high reps. Yes. And not everyone feels there. So there's a certain percentage of the population that doesn't like frog pumps because, yes, we can show in the research that abduction and external rotation of the hips increases glute activity. But some people's hips don't do well with that. They don't feel yes. their glutes much. And so probably one third of people don't like frog pumps, but there are another third that feel their glutes like crazy. So that's where individuality comes into play. If you're the a hip thrust responder, I'm sorry, a frog pump oh. responder, do frog pump. Do them for high reps at the end of the workout. It can, uh, you know, and I do those more for aesthetics. Uh, that that doesn't resemble a functional position that much. Uh, it's a really wide stance or like externally rotated, but it's more for a big pump and burn a lot of metabolic stress. Uh, and and it's it, again, it's it's. It doesn't beat you up much. It's just something you do at the end of the workout to get a little more volume, a little more quality uh, activation in the glutes. But I don't think it's good for, like, a sport-specific thing. Oh, for uh, sure. For like, and you've yeah. said that many times. I've got two uh, two questions from uh, people. I had many questions on uh, Instagram. I'm just I picked two. One is Scott uh, Hollywood. Uh, he said, is there a specific percentage uh, rep max you find best for – Grow and is it different for men or women? We answered that part, but is it different for men or women? Um, that's a good question. I do think um, <laughs> in the research there was a study on women showing that they re they actually respond better to heavy weights than lighter weights, and then another study just came out showing the opposite. I think what I say, as a personal trainer, as a coach, okay, this happens all the time if you're a personal trainer. You get, and it happens more with like skinnier women that they're strong, but like maybe their upper body is smaller, but they have really strong legs. You'll get them to do, okay, here's what I do. I get my trainer. They can't do a deadlift. It's too heavy for them. We pick it up for them. I pick up one side and my trainer picks up one side and we start them out from the top and now they can do six reps with it. So with guys, it's a, a lot of guys don't have this as much as women where, like, yeah, if you start women at the top of a deadlift, sometimes they can get a weight they can't do for one rep max pulling it from the ground. They can do it for like six reps. Or rec pull. And that's something you, you, you learn in the field. There's no research on that. You just learn that. And so... Uh, sometimes they have more inhibitory, in my opinion, on certain lifts. They have more inhibition when it's heavy. And maybe it's because we have bigger spines, bigger upper bodies, and we stabilize better. We don't sense, we don't have inhibition due to, like, danger signals going off, you know? Maybe they do. May, maybe. So in my experience, I think they do a little better with a little bit higher rep rate, reps than, than men. Sure. Like, maybe the best, maybe, maybe, Six to ten is best for men, and maybe eight to twelve is best for women. You know, you or because twelve because different two angle because of their hips, or my I'm good it could, research. <laughs> well, it could be a lot of different things. It could be yeah, it's it's probably anatomical, but it also maybe has some physiological with like estrogen. Oh. Who knows? I don't know, but uh, uh, or it could be psychological. Men care more about heavy lifting, and so they get. They get more practice with it. We get better at it because we care so much about our one rep max. And women, I, I don't know, but it, it's uh, it's fascinating. And those are the little things. But it, ultimately, it depends on the lifter, and it might depend on the lift as well because some reps are con more conducive to heavier weight. Oh, sorry, some exercise more conducive to heavier weight, some more conducive to lighter weight for higher reps. Right. 
Excellent. I've got a quality movement from uh, Croatia, Zagreb, uh, Amir. He says, have you ever measured the difference in glute activation between unilateral and bilateral hip thrust? Yes. And bilateral gets you much higher. Um, interestingly, because a lot of people love single leg hip thrust. Um, but, uh, yeah, when you do a heavy bilateral hip thrust or, like, go to failure, you'll exceed 100% of MBIC because the MBIC position is just whatever you can do isometrically. You'll get over 100% of MBIC. When you do a single leg hip thrust, you might get 70 to 80%. However, I still think it's good to do both, and I think it's good to get better at single leg. Yeah. I know with me... I like using body weight with single leg. If I put a, a dumbbell or a barbell, I just feel off. But then I've got friends. I've got some colleagues who can do like, you know, my buddy Ben Bruno can do a single leg hip thrust with like 225 pounds. It's unbelievable. Um, I can't even budge the bar with that. And he loves them. And he likes them more than bilateral because when he has 500 pounds on his hips, it just hurts. It doesn't feel good for him. So, uh, you know, as a personal trainer, you realize we ha we operate in shades of gray, not black and white. So whenever you, whenever I see a coach or a personal trainer talking in black and white and making absolute statements like he doesn't tra really train anyone, or sure. he doesn't train effectively, because every client is an n equals one case study, and you're trying to find the best exercises, the best variations, the best stances, the best postures, the best rep ranges. For, for them, and it depends on their unique anatomy, their preferences, their logistics, their um, you know. That's their an goals. excellent point. Excellent point. <laughs> uh, Brad, there's a new book coming out, Loot Lab book. Uh, when is it out? Um, I pre-ordered it. <laughs> Just saying. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, that's coming out on. So it's on Amazon right now, but I haven't announced yeah. it. Uh, we, 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 me and my. Uh, co-author Glenn Cordoza have been working on this for over a year and awesome. it's so comprehensive and it's I'm like you know how they the say every Bible. book is like yeah it's a glute bible so it, yeah, every book people will say well once it, once it goes to print it's two years outdated that's not true when this gets printed it'll be three months behind what we're doing here in the glute lab and I'm so proud of that because I'm pushing the pushing it to the end, you know, to the limit on what I can squeeze in before it goes to print. So I think I got another, like, month or two till it goes to print. I think, anyway, it'll be out in, I think, May or something like that, around Perfect. there. So I'm so excited about it. It's going to be a really good book for people. And I think some people are going to be proud to put it on their coffee table, you know, because you're going to have all the people's favorite exercise, and it's really comprehensive, shows all the different variations talks about the art the science program design component and all that so that's excellent it can be handy for every personal trainer uh germ pop anybody that wants to properly train their uh their physique their glutes their power their strength or whatever the good biomechanics and backed up by research um i know you are really busy um i'm just uh want you to say yes about uh doing a couple of uh uh, workshops. Uh, you know I'm pushing for Athens and probably in Europe. Um, I'm going to be pushing till you uh, have constraint orders um, on me. Um, <laughs> looking forward to that. Thank you so much for your time. And before we, we, uh, we go, I, I want you to just name some people that were a true inspiration for who you are today. Okay. Um... Obviously, it's like everyone has these celebrities that they idolize, and, and you know, I have always idolized Arnold Schwarzenegger and The Rock and people like that, but the people who really influenced my career path, at first, it was the strength coaches that came before me, or, or, or it's funny, because I'm, like, older than some of them, but they were just very influential 15 years back, you know, um, guys like... Uh, Joe DeFranco, Jason Frugia, Eric Cressy, Mike Robertson, Mike Boyle, uh, uh, Martin Rooney, J.C. Santana. Um, yeah, Carlos. Yeah. There's yeah. so many. I know I'm leaving guys out. Um, Mark Westegan. All these guys that were the popular straight coaches from 
you know, 10 to 20 years ago. These guys were the guys, and even like Charlie Francis, all these guys who now he's passed away, but yeah, legend. Yeah, like Mel Stiff, like from Super Training. So those guys were always my my idols. And now it's kind of switched over time to where now it's the researchers who, who kind of pushed me to be better, like Brad Schoenfeld and James Krieger and um, all these guys who 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 make me not slack uh, off on um you know they make sure I don't slack on my on my uh science portion cuz it's easy to get here in the gym and just focus on what I'm doing in the gym and not publish and not go to conferences and not care about that world but that's ultimately what we need to get us to the next level you know exactly Brent thank you so much for your time it was a uh, privilege having you and uh, looking forward to seeing you in person. <laughs> yes. Again. I look forward to Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you so much, Brett.